Over the last month or so, I've done a few videos, well, it's actually two videos, on teams that are once powerhouses of Formula 1 and motorsport in general, that just seemed to be on life support for a few years into the 1990s, and then just dropped off completely. Those teams were Lotus and Brabham, both huge parts of 1960s Formula 1, both having a decent amount of success, with Lotus surpassing Ferrari in titles at one point, and being revolutionary in terms of wings, aero, sponsorship, and stuff like that. Well, at least Lotus was anyway, even if they weren't the first ever team in racing to do that kind of stuff. Brabham holds the distinction of being the only team to win a championship, with the team owner driving the car. But nothing lasts forever. In 1982, Colin Chapman died of a heart attack and Lotus began its downward spiral. The team was no longer run by a visionary who could get things done his way, with his brain feeding ideas to the team, making sure it all works. In 1970, Jack Brabham sold half of his team to Bernie Eccleston, and while Brabham was able to win a couple more championships in the 80s and still be competitive, by the end of that decade they were sliding backwards and money was drying up, before ultimately folding midway through 1992. But there is a third team, a team that had also started up in the 1960s and managed to carry on, but has a slightly different ending, because the team ended on the owner's own terms. That team was Tyrrell. So, a brief history of the team to get us set up to where it all starts to go downhill, because getting straight in would be like skipping to something like the Rebel Assault on the Death Star, and not knowing who this 7-foot asthmatic bloke in the suit is. So Ken Tyrrell had been the manager of Matra's entry into Formula 1 in the late 1960s, combining the entry with his junior team. And Tyrrell by this point had formed a long-running partnership with Jackie Stewart. And while Jackie had been in Formula 1 with BRM, another team I need to look at at some point, as soon as Ken was in F1, Jackie was driving for him, with every single one of their contracts being done on a handshake. In 1969, Matra became the only other team besides Ferrari to have a Constructors' Championship winning car built outside of England, as the MS-10, powered by the Ford DFV, dominated the championship in Stewart's hands, and Ken would have his own chassis built for the 1970 season. Basically, he had an argument with Matra. Ken wanted to keep using the DFV, while Matra insisted they use their V12s. In 1970, the Tyrrell 001 debuted and was unreliable, but the kinks would be ironed out for 1971. That year, Stewart would win again, driving the 003. The 002 was only used by Stewart's teammate Francois Sever, from what I can tell from results pages, but the 003 was an upgrade of the 002, which was in turn an upgrade from the 001. With this weird front wing that was seen on a few cars of the time, Brabham and March used something similar. It must have worked because, well, it doesn't really resemble a front wing that we're used to. It doesn't look like anything Lotus had, that's for sure. 72 was another not-so-fruitful season. It then went into 1973, where Stewart would win his third and final World Championship, and he would retire from the sport completely. Also in this season, Francois Sever was killed at the 1973 US Grand Prix, which was supposed to be Stewart's final race, but Stewart pulled out after that accident. So with Stuart gone and Sever tragically killed, Tyrrell had to replace both drivers. South African Jody Schechter and Frenchman Patrick Depaye were hired, and Tyrrell slipped to mid-pack with the occasional good result, such as winning a race with Schechter driving the six-wheeled P34, one of the new concepts that appeared at that time, along with Brabham's fan car. And a video I need to do at some point because, well, my dad asked me to do it. He asked me to do it ages ago, I've just never got round to it. But despite hiring the likes of Schechter, Peterson, Depaye and Jabouille over the rest of the 1970s, Tyrrell wasn't getting close to winning championships as Lotus continued to innovate, Ferrari had louder, and McLaren had now established itself as a front runner. So we get to where it starts to turn on its head. In 1980, Tyrrell ran the car with no sponsors. None. None at all. All it had on the side of the car was just the logo of the team on an all-blue design, and while the rest of the grid was transitioning over to turbo engines, Tyrrell was hanging on to the DFV, because turbos were too expensive to have without proper funding. Tyrrell did manage to get sponsorship from the Italian domestic appliance company Candy, and this proved to be a massive shock in one of the final events of the Fisa Foca War. Tyrrell needed the money, there's no doubt about that, and that's going to be a common theme throughout this video. During the 1982 season, the Foca aligned teams decided to boycott the San Marino Grand Prix that year because of Piquet and Rosberg being disqualified from the Brazilian Grand Prix. The whole water-cooled brakes thing I think I've done before. Actually, yes, I have done that video before. Boiled Brakes Brings Boycott was the title of that one. Brabham, McLaren, Williams and Lotus decided to not turn up, but Acela, ATS and Tolman decided to race. Osella because they were Italian and wanted to be at home, and the other two teams doing so because of sponsor obligations. 
Now, Ken, hugely loyal to the focus side of things, did the unthinkable and crossed the picket line. With his cars on the grid, the 1982 San Marino Grand Prix became official and points would be awarded. Because he had an Italian driver and Italian sponsorship at a race in Italy, keeping the team alive mattered more than anything else. Alboreto finished the race in third, giving Ken much needed points. The following year in 1983, Alboreto would take the last win for the Cosworth DFE when he won at Detroit. After every race that Tyrrell won, they would hoist the Union flag above the wooden shed that they'd started the team in, and it would actually be the 33rd and final time this would happen, and it would also be shown in a local paper, because the local paper followed the Formula 1 team. Ken had tried on several occasions to move with the times. He'd got on the ground effect revolution quite quickly. He was the first outside of Lotus to get the DFV, and he was determined to also keep the naturally aspirated engines working as the field migrated to more powerful turbos. Whether that was because he wouldn't or couldn't, it's probably a bit of both. And since he was not as money rich as the rest of the field, and at the same time being quite a welcoming and warm place to be, Tyrrell became the place for young up-and-coming drivers to get some F1 experience. Alboreto, Brundle, Berloff, Sullivan, Alesi, Sarlo, and so on would all be drivers to come through the team. In 1984, though, Tyrrell would be kicked out of the championship entirely for the lead shot controversy. Again, something I've done before, so I won't keep you too long with that bit. It's a shame considering both Berloff and Brundle managed to score podiums with the car at Monaco and Detroit, but then got kicked out of the championship, so no points, no prize money. For 1985 though, Tyrrell finally joined the rest of the grid with having turbos, although it was a mid-season switch. It was also proof that it might not have been engines that were the issue, because the car was a dog. In 1987 though, they would be back on naturally aspirated engines, because the FIA decided if you want to use them, you can. It was turbo only all the way through 1986. For 1987 though, they introduced two new championships, the Colin Chapman and Jim Clark trophies, which were awarded to the best naturally aspirated car and team throughout the course of 1987. It's something that not many people know about or remember because all of those cars at the back of the grid that were still using NA engines were considered dead men walking. But in the late 80s into the 90s, things looked like they might pick up again. Tyrrell had managed to grab Harvey Postlethwaite from Ferrari, and Harvey had been instrumental in designing the first high-nose F1 car, the 019. This car was introduced two races into the 1990 season, and it was a design that would evolve into the default design for a Formula 1 car by the midpoint of 1996, which, again, I need to look at. If you know, you know. Although this high-nosed Tyrrell would become the default design for F1 cars for many, many years, it might have had its origins somewhere else. Prior to joining Tyrrell, Postlethwaite was John Barnard's man on the ground at Ferrari, and Barnard, who was working out of an office in England, had the shock of his life with this thing. The story goes that he'd been doing design work and said to Ferrari, I need this design tested in the wind tunnel. When he was told that he couldn't have the wind tunnel, he flew out to Maranello and found Piero Ferrari and Postlethwaite testing a, well, different kind of Ferrari that Barnard claims looked a lot like what Tyrrell turned up to the San Marino Grand Prix of 1990 with. A car that Jean Alesi scored a second place with at the Monaco Grand Prix of that year. With a bit of extra cash, it might look like Tyrrell would be onto a winner, but it was going to be another one of those cases of, we've got something we can do something with, but can't. And because a lot of the other teams were tagging onto the idea, it was going to be a case of, we came up with it, but they're doing a better job. And money was still tight, as you can probably gather from the running theme through this video. So tight that Ken had to drive the lorry containing the cars and all the equipment to the Monaco Grand Prix of 1990. He had a UK heavy goods vehicle license. Imagine Gunther Steiner doing that today. It'd be like something out of Grand Theft Auto. But other problems were arising. A lazy was too good and had been offered contracts by Williams and Ferrari, a contract dispute that saw him go to Ferrari in the end. I don't know if Ken also did this, but Eddie Jordan was very good at making sure he took an amount of, um, well, let's call it compensation when his drivers left. He got money from Ferrari for Eddie Irvine and probably got some for Barrichello when he went to Stewart. He took both the Schumachers for a few million as well. But Tyrrell's young talent was off, and Tyrrell also lost two key personnel to Ferrari and Benetton. 1991, with an upgraded 020 and money from Brown, the, you know, shaving people, it wasn't the upward trend they might have anticipated. The Mugen V10 messed the weight balance up and the car was tricky to drive. Modena would get a front row start at Monaco and could have been second but retired, but he'd then get second in Canada. 
Halfway through that season, Postlethwaite was off to Sauber, with the team struggling on tyres that, according to Motorsport magazine, were broken. By broken, I mean there was no consistency between those Pirelli tyres. No two tyres were consistent, let alone a whole set. So you could go out and do a run and cook the left front tyre. You might go out again on a new set and nuke the right rear. Or you could put a third set on and they'd last forever. The only good thing about 1993 is that Ken, for the first time since 1968, was not paying for engines. Brown had naffed off because the results weren't there, and now they were back to how they were in the 80s, struggling to get sponsorship and a decent driver at the same time. Ron Dennis had noticed that Tyrrell had pretty much bypassed the 1980s and the commercial expansion of the sport that everybody else had got on board with. It was like Ken was still trying to operate as he had done in 1971, and it just wasn't working anymore. And because he hadn't or couldn't keep up with everybody else, he was lagging right behind. And Ron was willing to give Ken all the pointers to get back on track. Ron had actually got them those Mugen engines in the early 90s. Motorsport Magazine said it was like they dragged themselves from 1970 to 1990 and missed the 80s completely. It's also interesting to note here that by this point Brabham had already gone and Lotus wasn't too far away. Ligier was still going, Minardi was operating on a shoestring budget, Arrows, or Footwork as they were called at this point, were still pootling along. Also at this point, Jordan had already entered the series and were doing things that were considered miracles. So to paraphrase Metallica, the light at the end of the tunnel is just a freight train coming the other way. It seems that Ken was able to put aside his pride and listen to Dennis, as 1994 seemed to be a step back in the right direction. Ukio Katayama had brought some much needed backing from Mild 7, and Mark Blundell provided a safe set of hands, with Blundell being hired on ability rather than money. Postlethwaite was back and the car was a bit more solid than it had been, with Blundell taking a podium at the Spanish Grand Prix. But there was still no safety net with money. It was a case of make do with what you've got and make sure it doesn't blow up while you're driving, with Blundell having his brakes explode because they'd done too many miles. Tyrrell finished seventh that year, which by all accounts is great, and they outlived LaRousse and Lotus that collapsed at the season's end. Really, the only teams around them that had the same sort of longevity as they did were Ligier, Ferrari, McLaren and Arrows. Maybe Williams. Ferrari is Ferrari. McLaren had Ron Dennis, were about to get Mercedes engines, and were, like Ferrari, covered in Marlboro logos. Ligier was well connected with the French government and had a safety net, also investment from Tom Walkinshaw and Flavio Briatore. Arrows had just lost the footwork deal because of, well, stuff I might need to do in a future video, and if you throw Benetton and Williams into the mix, they had factory Renault engines, genius designers like Braun and Nui, star drivers, and tobacco money falling out of their arses. There is no way Ken could compete with that. Mika Salo coming on board for 1995 helped massively thanks to his Nokia sponsorship and being rated as a driver in general. In 1995, much like 1994, the car had gone back to the older school low nose design, one of only a handful of teams to run that sort of setup. Five points was all they could get, all scored by Salo, with Katayama's best result being seventh in a sea of pink as he retired from most races. They actually scored the same amount of points as Footwork, who scored their only points of the season with a third place at Adelaide, where, well, basically, nobody finished. And they were ahead of Minardi, Forti, Pacific and Simtech. They were as low as they could possibly be, really. Really, they were only racing Minardi through 1996 because Forti went bust halfway through the season. In 1997, three teams ran V8 engines, Minardi, Lola and Tyrrell. Tyrrell had a Ford V8, which was not unlike the 1994 engine run by Benetton, but the difference in power between them and the Stuart cars which ran factory Ford V10s was evident. 50 horsepower quoted by some sources, the engine was the letdown on a car that was half decent and they had two decent drivers in Verstappen and Salo, but the season was more of a battle with Minardi than anybody else because they just didn't have the power. But they didn't have the X-Wings which became something most of the teams copied before being banned by the 1998 San Marino Grand Prix. But as a note as to how stuck in 1971 they were, it's reported that Ken's wife was still making the lads in the garages sandwiches instead of having a proper catering facility like all the other teams would have had, even Minardi. So at the end of 1997, Ken finally swallowed his pride and sold the team. He was going out on his terms, selling the team to British American Tobacco that would rename the team BAR for 1999. But by only the second race of the 1998 season, Ken had quit his own team. He was still the team leader and team principal until he was suitably pissed off. 
He wanted Jos Verstappen in the car, but BAT was insistent on hiring 1995 Formula 3000 runner-up Ricardo Rossit, who had driven for footwork in 1996, been part of the ill-fated Lola team in 1997, and would now be back in 1998. Ken wanted someone who was decent, but BAT had hired someone who, at Monaco, would become a bit of a meme. BAT did own the team, but they weren't pumping money into the team because they were too busy focusing on 1999. The team was still pretty much broke. Rossett was a bit out of his depth. Murray Walker made a quip about the conversation about whether Rossett was good enough, to which Brundle replied with, it's a short conversation, or words to that effect. At Monaco, Tyrrell had brought a new front wing, and Rossett had spun at the second half of the swimming pool section. He tried to do one of those flick spins to right the car, but only ended up driving straight into a gap in the barrier. After which, the mechanics in the pits took his paddock scooter and swapped the R of Rossett with the T. So it read, Tosser. But it seems that Ken's anger was warranted. Rossett failed to make the 107% cutoff five times that season, and I remember Tyrrell at the time being the laughingstock of the grid. From looking through accounts, results, and bits and pieces like that, it seems that on multiple occasions Tyrrell had a springboard, but for whatever reason couldn't make the jump. They couldn't take the opportunities they were given. And in a lot of cases, the car they turned up to the first race of the season with was the car they'd have for the whole year because there just wasn't the money to develop. Brabham had several changes in ownership. Lotus had to deal with the fallout of their founder dying, but Ken soldiered on despite minimal budgets and setback after setback, and at the end of it all, sold the team under his own terms to keep it running. The DNA of Tyrrell is insane, as it goes from Tyrrell to BAR to Honda to Braun to Mercedes. The DNA goes from shoestring to a team that enjoyed a run of eight straight titles, and also includes Braun winning a title as a pure underdog, which, in a way, kept the spirit of Tyrrell very much alive. So while Lotus and Brabham died off as a result of ownership changes and not being able to secure factory engines, Tyrrell's was a little bit different. It was a case of being left behind, either as a case of they couldn't keep up or wouldn't keep up. But because Ken Tyrrell was able to keep this thing running for so long on minimal budgets and with basically no money and making it run as he had done in 1970 while everybody else had joined the modern world, it kind of makes you appreciate Tyrrell that little bit more. So then, a look at the downfall of the Tyrrell team between sort of 1980 or so and 1998. If this has been an interesting video for you, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you don't miss out. And also, get me through this final slog towards 100,000 subscribers. Massive thanks as ever to the fine bunch of lads at Patreon for the support. And if you want to help out at a more personal level, there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and other bits and bobs that you might want or need to know. Or well, the super thanks and memberships if that's more your thing. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.